Good morning. Good morning. And now let us stand and raise joyful voices as we participate with the call to worship and read responsibly. Welcome to the house of the Lord. We have, we have come, come bringing our pain and our, and our joys. God is waiting for you to heal and comfort you. We need, we need the refreshing, restoring love of Christ. The table of the Lord is prepared for you. Come, Come, Almighty, and, and deliver us, us and let us, us receive life. And now let's join together in hymn 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
We gather this day in giving thanks for all the blessings that we have experienced in the, the last week or so. We, our lives are so blessed, and it's truly good that we can come to the house of the Lord and offer our prayers in praise and thanksgiving. We also, though, come with great need and concerns, not only for ourselves, but for our community and our world. And so I invite you now to bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. You are mighty, O oh God. You are our creator and sustainer of life. And you're the one who brings to us everything we need to follow your call. And today we begin this prayer with gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you have done in our midst. We thank you, Holy One, for the abundance of your love in Christ. We thank you that through Christ's choice to die for our sins, we have forgiveness and grace. And we offer ourselves even in, broke, in the brokenness that we are, we offer ourselves to you this day. We thank you for your unconditional love. And we thank you, Lord, that through the power of Jesus Christ, we can come to you and bring our, our prayers, our prayers of intercession. We pray for others this day. We pray for their illnesses and sicknesses. We pray for those that are undergoing treatment of disease. And we thank you, Lord, that you're the mighty healer through Christ. We also thank you that you're our comforter. Sometimes we need comfort because we've lost loved ones. Sometimes our comfort is needed because of discouragement and brokenness. Help us always, oh God, to see beyond our needs and our problems, to see you. You are our hope and truly our salvation. And so today, as we worship in this place, we give thanks for our church and the opportunity to worship and to be in ministry and mission around this community and around the globe. We thank you for lives that are being transformed because you're taking our hands, our feet, our resources, and using it for your glory. Now, Lord, bless those that are in leadership from our church, to our community, to our legislature, to our world leaders. Protect, O oh God, those who protect us. And may we always and everywhere glorify your name as we now join our voices and our hearts and we share together that prayer that you taught your own disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory.
Choir, thank you so much. Powerful tune. Catherine, thank you. Good job. Roy. Catherine's an awesome flautist. Does that say that right? Freshman in high school. She's got a career ahead of her, doesn't she? I want to ask our kids to come down. Where are our children today? Come on. I'm glad to see everybody today. You know, uh, <clears throat> we're talking about faith, and um, I'm wondering if you have faith in God that you can do some great things. I mean, I look around at your faces, and I know some of you, some of you do some pretty incredible things, like some of you are runners, some of you are swimmers, some of you are in drama, some of you do all kinds of different things. And, you know, one of the things, I used to play tennis and do different things, too. And, and I just wondered, do you have faith enough that maybe before you're an event, do you ever pray? Do you ask God to be with you? Yeah. You know, God is not a genie. In other words, God, you don't rub a lamp and say, oh, God, grant me three wishes. You know, it doesn't work that way. But when we pray and ask God to help us do things, God does that. For instance... Do we have a big spelling test in the morning at school? Do we ask God, make me get 100? No. If we did, we'd all probably get 100, right? No. But we can ask God to help us remember what we've studied, right? And I believe God does that. God can do great things. And you know, all of us in this congregation, we pray that God will help us do lots of different things. You know, in Kentucky, basketball is pretty big right now. Kind of big. Not real big, but kind of big. Especially, well, anyway. There's a guy on the Kentucky basketball team that's a pretty good basketball player. But he's having some problems right now. He shoots what they call a three-pointer. And he's really good at it. But the last few games, he hadn't been able to hit one. Yeah, we're talking about Devin Booker. But you know what? One of these days, he's a man who has faith. I learned this about him recently. And he's a man who will do well. He hasn't given up hope. We should never give up our hope. So take that with you as you go back to your seats after we pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the hope that we find in Christ. And we have faith to believe that you are always there for us. We see it in the faces of our children. They hear your voice. We ask you, mighty and holy God, to bring your blessing now upon our children and their families and on this whole congregation. In, the name we, in God's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to ask the congregation to stand, and I want you all to sing with me. Number 337, we're going to sing verses 1 and 3 of Only Trust Him. Let's sing together.
seated. Let's pray together. We thank you, O oh God, again now as the word is revealed to us that uh, your blessing, your truth, your endless hope will come upon our lives. Give us, O oh God, now the wisdom and may the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth, may they be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we're finishing up our series on segments of faith, and I want to invite you to get out your note page that's on your bulletin. And by the way, some of you said, Phil, I just don't like taking notes. And I said, well, you don't have to write it down. There's not going to be a test, but uh, it's just there for you to help you give a little guide, so don't panic on that. Uh, I noticed I held up three for verse three. Nobody followed me today. Anyway, so you're not listening anyway, so I didn't know. <laughs> Anyway, okay, let's get into it. What kind of faith do you have? You ever think about that? What kind of faith do you have? And I hope your faith is one that's growing. You know, I've discovered in my years of ministry that people have a lot of different kinds of ideas about their faith. I, I know some people who have faith that is passed on to them by their parents. And it's kind of secondhand. We don't have our own kind of faith. We have our parents' faith. And as a result... It ends up being a little bit bland, a little boring. It's kind of black and white. There's no room for gray area in there. Some families have a faith that, uh, uh, where they attend church for the kids' sake. It's just for the family. It's not for them personally. I, I know some people who have what I call a 60 minutes kind of faith. It's, uh, we, we give God an hour a week whether God needs it or not, you know. <laughs> And, and then I know some people have a faith that is great as long as everything is going okay. But when problems start to come along, boy, they begin to wonder, well, is this God thing really real or not? And then some of us have a faith where we, we only use when we get in trouble. Uh, some people have a, a, what I call the cheers faith. Remember that old show, Cheers? They, we, we just use it where everybody knows our name kind of thing. But none of those faiths are genuine. And that's what I want you to hear. They are all counterfeit, or they're what I call a dead end. And the truth is, friends, some of us, in our lives right now, we're at a dead end. Somewhere in our faith journey. There are certain dead end words that we use in our world today. Words like cancer. Words like bankruptcy. Words like divorce. Words like uh, infertility. Infertility. Words like unemployment, those are dead-end words that we use today. But my question is, though, how do we know when we are at a dead end? Well, things get out of our control, and we can't do anything about it. When you're at that point, you're at a dead end. And, and what do we do? What do we do when we get to a dead end and we're waiting for deliverance? Well... I want to share a scripture with you, and it's not on your note page, so just listen very carefully. It's found in Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. And the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's talking about Abraham. And he talks about what Abraham did when he waited for deliverance to come to him when he was at a dead end. Listen to this. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, he gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, on your note page, what do we do when we get to a dead end and we're waiting for deliverance? Well, one of the first things we learn from the scripture is we've got to remember what God can do. You might write that down. You, you've got to remember what God can do. 
The situation may be out of our control, but it's not out of God's control. And that's what I want you to hear. When we face a dead end, we don't focus on what we can't do. We focus, rather, on what God can do. Look at that scripture again in verse 17. It says, Abraham believed in God who gives life to the dead and who creates something out of nothing. There are two things, friends, that God uh, does that we can't do. And that is raise the dead and create something out of nothing. That's the definition of what I call a miracle. First, God can give life to something that's dead. And if God can give life to a dead human being, surely he can give God life to a, I don't know, a dead career. Surely God can give life to a dead marriage. Surely God can give life to a, a I don't know, a dead dream. We've been talking about dreams. Maybe God can give life to a financial dead end. God can create something out of nothing. God doesn't need anything to work with. That scripture again. Abraham believed in God who gives life to the dead and who creates something out of nothing. And friends, I want to tell you, this wasn't just positive thinking that Abraham lived in. You know, I often recommend positive thinking uh, because, I, what's the alternative, right? Negative thinking. And who wants to do that? But positive thinking is not faith. And I want you to hear that. Positive thinking, faith, they're two very different things. Positive thinking works great in situations where we've got control over it. If you just need an attitude change, then I highly recommend positive thinking. Christians ought to be the most positive people in the world. Okay, so we got a little work to do on that one. But anyway, positive thinking works fine in situations where we are in control. But in situations that are out of our control, friends, we need something more. Positive thinking is just worthless. It's just wishful thinking. And it, it's being positive, but it doesn't change the situation. When we face things that are out of our control, friends, we need something more than just positive mental attitude. We need faith in God. Faith in God because God can control it when we can't. Most of life, and you're not going to want to hear this, but most of our lives are out of our control. And so we need faith far more than we need positive thinking. Everybody get it? All right. In Luke 18, it says, What is possible with men is po impossible with men is possible with God. God specializes in the impossible, and we call that a miracle. Let's go on. Number two. We need to rely on what God has said. Rely on what God has said. In Romans 4, verse 8, it says, When hope was dead within him, Abraham went on hoping in faith. He relied on the Word of God. How do you know when hope has died in your life? How do you know? You might just begin to listen to your speech. Are you starting to use the word never a lot? Like, I'm never going to get married. Or, I'm never going to graduate and finish school. Or I'm never going to get well. Or I'm never going to get out of debt. Or I'm never going to be able to let go of my past and forget all those hurts and heartaches I've been through. I'm never going to be able to change. I'm never going to be able to become what God wants me to be. I'm never going to see this situation turn around. When you start using that word never, 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 hope begins to die. And so what would we do when hope dies? Well, it's kind of interesting, but the scripture says, keep on hoping. Look at that. It says, when hope was dead within him, Abraham went on hoping in faith. He relied on the word of God. My friends, listen, when we're at a dead end, we need our Bible. We need to study it. We need to memorize it. We need to read it. We need to... Uh, I don't know, make flashcards about it. I don't know, do whatever we can to take the words off the page and put them in our mind, in our hearts. It's full of promises. It's full of promises for you and me. And we rely on the Word. When we rely on the Word, it will revive our lives emotionally. Nothing else can encourage us like the Bible can. And when we rely on the Word of God, friends, we don't, we don't panic when we hit a dead end because we know... It may be out of our control, but it's not out of God's control. And that, while we're here, let me say this. A dead end 
is a test of faith. I don't know, you might write that somewhere. A dead end is a test of faith. In Hebrews 11, it says, While God was testing him, Abraham still trusted in God and his promises as he offered his son, Isaac. Wow. God said he wanted Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And Abraham, he didn't blink an eye. How many of you have sons here today? Just, just curious. Yeah. If God asked you to sacrifice your son, would you hesitate? I would. I know. I'm just, I don't have enough faith. But Abraham didn't blink an eye. Abraham actually expected God to raise his son from the dead. In fact, when they went walking off up the mountain, Abraham turned to his servants and said, We'll be back. Yeah. And on the way, Isaac said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, Well, son, the Lord will provide. And we know the rest of that story, right? But what happens when God takes our most precious dream and wants to us to give it up? Hmm? Can we do that in faith? You know, in Romans 4, verse 18, let's go back to that scripture, it says, Though it seemed Abraham's hope could not be fulfilled, he did not become the father, he did become, sorry, he did become the father of many nations, exactly as God had promised. Some of us in this room right now are at a dead end somewhere in our lives. It seems like there's just no way out. Things never look, though, as bleak as they seem. I want to tell you that. We tend to look at it from our human standpoint, and we don't see it from God's viewpoint. And they're two very different things. It's all in the way we look at it. I think about those disciples, how they followed Jesus Christ for three years, and then all of a sudden, here he is, he's hanging on a cross. He's dead. My friends, those disciples are in despair, and they're at a dead end. They don't know what to do. From their viewpoint, it seemed like their whole world had just come crashing down around them. Easter is only three days away, but they didn't know that. God had a bigger plan. God had a bigger idea. God brings to life, friends, those things that are dead, and that's a miracle. Though it seemed, there's the scripture again, though it seemed Abraham's hope could not be fulfilled, he did become the father of many nations exactly as God had promised. A promise, my friends, is only as good as the character of the one who's making the promise. And the Bible says that God cannot lie. Do you know there are some things that God can't do? Did you know that? Because God put a limit on himself. And one of those things is God cannot lie. God is truth, all truth. And if God makes a promise to you, God is going to fulfill that promise just the way God said it would happen. We remember what God can do and we rely on what God said. Let's go on to number three here. We've got to face the facts with faith. Write that down in your notes. Face the facts with faith. In Romans 4, verse 19 and following, it says, Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And Sarah's womb was also dead. And yet he didn't waver with unbelief. My friends, Abraham is 99 years old. And God says, you're going to have a baby. I don't know who the oldest person in this room is, but just if you're over 50 and happy birthday to RB, you're what? You're, where are you, RB? Yeah. Woo. Bless your heart. What if God said to you, you're going to have a baby. There is a, there is a medical impossibility here, friends. Listen. There... Abraham and Sarah way beyond childbearing years. Why are we laughing about that? It just suddenly occurred to me. We're laughing about that, and yet we know the story. It happened, right? The Bible says he faced the fact, and yet he didn't waver in his unbelief. Faith, my friends, is not denying reality. Listen to that. It's not pretending that we don't have a problem. That's not faith, friends. That's denial. Faith isn't saying, well, I'm not in pain when I am. Faith doesn't say, well, I'm not hurting when I am. 
It doesn't say, faith is not saying, oh, I'm so happy when my world's falling apart. That's not faith, that's phoniness. And God says, I want to work in your life according to your faith. Faith is facing the facts without being discouraged by them. Being able to look at a problem and say, yeah, there's a problem in my life, but I know God can overcome it. God is bigger than my problem. Friends, there, there is a brand of faith out there today that basically says, deny all your problems. Just, just have a positive confession. Name it and claim it. But I want to tell you, that kind of thinking didn't come from Jesus Christ. Faith is not denying reality, friends. Faith is facing reality, <coughs> faith, excuse me, facing reality without being discouraged by it. I mean, think about this. Could we all agree today that we know God can change things? Would we all agree with that? Which, can you nod your head, yes or no? Yeah, okay. Could we agree maybe that we could build a family on faith but not on fantasy? Could we agree that that we could build a business on faith, but not on fantasy? Could we agree that we could build a life on faith, but not on fantasy? You see, the key is to look at our circumstances. Uh, in verse two, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, We fix our eyes on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and that's your problem. But what is unseen, and that's God's power, is eternal. See, if we look at the world, friends, we're going to get distressed. If we look inside, we're going to get depressed. But if we look to Jesus Christ, we'll get some rest. It all depends on what we look at. Where are your eyes looking today? You know, circumstances are like a mattress. You get on top and you rest easy. But I hear people say to me all the time, well, under the circumstances, well, if you're going to get under the circumstances, you're going to die. If you look at Christ, who's out there beyond the problem, look at your deliverer rather than the problem, and you'll make it. You will make it. Get it? All right, let's finish up. The fourth one is we have to expect God to deliver me. Expect God to deliver to deliver me. My family, listen, in the situations that a lot of us are facing right now, what are we really expecting God to do? Hmm? What are we really expecting God to do? Truth is, some of us aren't expecting God to do anything. And folks, I want you to listen to this. God works in our life according to our expectation. That's called faith. The scripture says that. Listen to it again. But Abraham never doubted. He praised God for his blessing even before it happened. Hmm. And he was completely sure that God was able to do anything he promised. My friends, the ultimate form of faith is thanking God for something before it happens. If we wait until it's happened and then we thank God, that's called gratitude. Nothing wrong with that, but... Gratitude is when you thank God for what he's already done. Faith is when you thank him in advance of what he's about to do. When we're at a dead end, we need to thank God. The answer is already on its way. We might not see it yet, but thank God that it's already on its way. I, the greatest story about that, I think, in the Bible is when Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, had a brother named Lazarus. Remember him? He was sick. And Jesus was away off, and they called for Jesus to come and heal him. It took Jesus three days to get there, and in the meantime, Lazarus went from sick to even worse. He died. They've even put him in the tomb. And finally, Jesus arrives, and the people go, Oh, if you'd just been here a little earlier, you could have healed him. But Jesus said, Hey, I didn't come to heal him. What? No, I came to resurrect him. Hmm. Which is the greater miracle, I wonder. Anyway, you know the story. Jesus went over to the tomb and he began to pray. And he thanked God that he already heard his prayer. Not begging him, Oh, I sure hope you're going to heal him. He thanked God in advance, and that's faith, friends. And then he shouts out, Lazarus, come out. And he did. 
The Apostle Paul knew about that too. He writes in 2 Corinthians 1, he says, But this happened so we might not rely on ourselves, but on God's will, but on God, excuse me, who raises the dead. He has delivered us, he will deliver us, and we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. My friends, I stand before you today and say Christ has delivered us. Christ will deliver us, and Christ will continue to deliver us as well. And when God delivers us, friends, he takes us, he takes, uh, into, takes, into, takes us into his time of deliverance, and he does it in three different ways. Now put them down there at the bottom of your note page. You don't even have to write anything down. They're already there. The first one is circumstantial deliverance. God uses circumstances to deliver. Sometimes God miraculously alters the circumstance, and as in one case, the Red Sea comes apart, remember? That happens in our lives from time to time, but it's not going to happen all the time. That's just one of the ways that God delivers, changing the circumstance. Another way, number two, is God uses personal deliverance. God doesn't change the circumstance. He changes us from the inside out. God gives us a new dream. God gives us a new vision. God gives us a new purpose in life. Things begin to change, a new attitude, a new perspective. God helps us handle the situation which does not change, but we are changed. Some time ago, there was a great book out there called The Hiding Place. Anybody read that Corey Ten Boom's book, The Hiding Place? Any of you? Yeah? When Corey was a young woman, her fiancé broke off their engagement, and he married somebody else. Broke her heart, and she never married. She went to her father, though, and she asked him, she said, what do you do when love, when your love has been blocked? When you want to give love, but you can't do it. And her father said to her very wisely, he said, when your love has been blocked, you rechannel it. Folks, there are a lot of people who need love in our world today. A lot of people. And we should never hold ourselves in a prison or build a barrier around ourselves, never build up the walls and say, well, I'm never going to give my love away to him again because I'm not going to let myself be hurt like I was before. We need to rechannel that love in a new direction. And the last one, the ultimate, the ultimate deliverance is heaven. And I want you to listen very carefully. My family, listen, God has not promised to remove all of our pain in this world. God has not promised to solve every one of our problems in ways that we would see fit. God has not promised to keep all our loved ones alive for the rest of our life. They're going to die. There is pain in this world. There will be sorrow. God has not promised that everything's going to work out the way we think it ought to work out. I mean, look around us. This is earth. We're not in heaven. And because it's earth, there will be pain and sorrow and suffering. But the ultimate deliverance, friends, is one day, one day, we're going to be in heaven where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more heartache. You see, the world hopes for the best. But Jesus, my friends, is our best hope. When we think to ourselves, well, I have faith, but nothing's happening. We need to pause and we need to realize that there's a word for deliverance in the Bible. It's called salvation. Salvation means deliverance. And Jesus is our Savior, our Deliverer. And if we're saved, it means that we're delivered. We're, it's the ultimate deliverance of heaven. But there's only one way it's going to happen. Only one. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, when we're at a dead end, my friends, Jesus can take our hopelessness and turn it into an endless hope. And so this morning, my question for all of us is, are you at a dead end at some point in your life? I want to invite you to take that problem, take that situation in your own life, and give it all to Jesus Christ. He may not deliver you the way you think it ought to be happening. But I guarantee you this, he will deliver if you trust. Let's pray together. Mighty are you, O God, and truly... Your character is one in which we can put our trust. And so today, we give thanks for the blessing that we have to know that you are not satisfied leaving us in dead ends of life, but you are eager to move us.
for new opportunities and deliverance. And so take us all, wherever we are, renew our faith and make us powerful for you. And we pray this with faith in the name of Christ, who is our deliverer, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to stand now. And let's turn in our hymnals to page 881 as we share together our affirmation of faith. Join me, will you, with your voices as we share in this historic profession of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And now, friends, our ushers are preparing to come forward, so let's prepare ourselves to offer our gifts and tithes in celebration of all that God does in our lives. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, we know that with you anything is possible. We know that you can take the worst situation and make it come out successful. We know that our hands, our soul, our spirits, we are truly in your hands. Guide us in all that we do, including our giving. Let these gifts and our tithes be given to your kingdom's work. In Jesus' name, amen.
Sing with me our closing hymn, number 128, He Leadeth Me. And let's sing verses 1 and 3. Thank you, O oh God, that you are our deliverer, and you deliver us to go from this place to the world to share the great news. And so now may your peace, peace that passes all understanding, may it be upon us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together. God be with you till we meet again.